vendors such as Tableau to help you make better sense of that data that you're collecting. The other presenter today is Chris Foster, who is one of our um, practice leads. He's a practice lead that manages our Western Canada, because it isn't all about Toronto as much as I'd like to think it is. Sorry, Chris. Uh, he manages our Western Canada consulting practice, as well as all of our open source data visualization, big data, and predictive analytic practice here at Newcomp. So he is responsible for quite a large portfolio. And I'm super excited he's going to be presenting to us today one of the newer features in Tableau Tableau Prep. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, have to probably just jump right into the presentation unless anybody has any uh, uh, objections to that. So that's our, our very brief agenda and our introductions. Okay, well thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm going to jump right in um, and talk about HIS Merit Travel Group and what we've done to innovate in order to compete in an in industry that, like many others, is facing a lot of disruption. Um, so we realized uh, early on that an enterprise data practice is critical in executing any strategy uh, that will be successful in meeting this sort of disruption, and in particular, exploiting network effects uh, in reorganizing the business uh, will help it to enable uh, the company to uh, develop an entrepreneurial company culture, one that's capable of hunting um, as yet undefined future businesses and opportunities. Um, so Merit Travel Group is in the travel business, whether it be through the consumer side of things, where we're um, selling directly to companies in our business to business model to leisure customers. Um, and, but on the other side of it, we also deal with uh, suppliers, and that includes the airlines, the hotels, cars, uh, tour operators. And what we're looking to do is to have a platform uh, developed that will allow us to leverage our 30 years of experience in the industry um, and all of the wonderful customer uh, interactions that we have um, in order to deliver a really best-in-class uh, travel solution for our customers. So a little bit about uh, HIS. HIS Co. Limited is based out of Japan, is traded on the Tokyo Stock Exchange, that is our parent, uh, since December 2016, with 606 billion yen in sales in 2017 for their fiscal year, and it's a globally diversified conglomerate. Uh, Merit Travel Group is the Canada-US um, operations for uh, HAS uh, travel, and we're, we've, we've been in business as an independent company for uh, 30 years, and in as I mentioned, in 2016, we were sold to uh, the Japanese parents. Uh, we service 350,000 annual tr uh, travelers uh, with an operating uh, sales revenue of about 380 million for this year. Uh, our fiscal is just about to end. We're 479 employees in Canada, and we operate across three business verticals. So in terms of the travel industry, uh, it's a very uh, well-developed industry and there are quite a lot of players. On the supplier side of things, we have air reservation systems, car reservations, hotel reservations, but independently of these systems, which are called GDS systems, the main two being Amadeus and Sabre, there are also uh, lately vendors who are directly interfacing with customers instead of through one of the uh, distribution platforms. And so you're seeing an industry that is being disrupted um, on that front in terms of being able to, with the information um, revolution, be able to interface directly with um, their customers in a much more cost-effective way, and they've taken advantage of that. As well, there are wholesaler channels uh, that are increasingly being involved, especially in the tour and cruise uh, excursion uh, side of things amongst the vendors. The second uh, middle person is sort of the uh, travel agencies and the loyalty points programs. And we are the uh, interface directly before the end user. So whether it's a leisure traveler who travels between um, one destination to another or may call in to get their points uh, converted into airline flights, um, or it's a, it's a corporate uh, type of business where there's a business-to-business -business interface uh, for uh, a corporation as a whole. So, for 
for example, Deloitte or uh, Canada Steamship Lines, um, two of our major accounts, would have um, travel provided through our travel, uh, corporate travel solutions uh, through our third vertical, which is the business to business uh, side of the equation. So really these three types of businesses operate direct to consumer, indirectly to consumer, or direct to business. And so that's where we currently reside. Um, the problem is there is disruption in the industry and one of the classic um, methods in which a company might choose to respond to disruption is to vertically integrate. Uh, unfortunately, as the example of Amazon shows, uh, brick and mortar is under threat across all retail segments. Um, and that includes reasons such as uh, having very high capital costs, um, involved in maintaining a brick and mortar operations, but the low margins of our industry specifically in the car, hotel, um, and airfare um, business makes it an unattractive market to continue to further vertically integrate in. Uh, so for example, buying an airline, maybe starting up a low cost carrier, those sort of things will not yield us uh, the growth that we're looking for. Um, a third problem is that in the entrenched legacy systems, the GDS systems, the booking systems that uh, I alluded to earlier, they're being bypassed by new entrants uh, such as Airbnb. So this is a, not a good strategy and or it's very improbable to be uh, the high yield, high margin um, activities that we're after as a business. The second a uh, strategic choice a company might make is to horizontally integrate. Uh, so to acquire other companies and M&A activities to sort of develop a, a global uh, presence in the industry. Um, for us, it would be buying other travel agencies and try to develop a monopoly in North America so that it um, integrates well with our Asian operations, uh, which are very strong on the HIS uh, side of things. So this strategy would involve uh, being very highly focused on ex expanding the coverage and footprint that we're able to offer to our customers. Now there are some risks involved in that. Uh, one is that our company currently, uh, because of the organization and the natural organic growth uh, through the past 30 years, uh, is highly siloed and so the information sharing uh, within the company um, is difficult. Uh, and so we won't be able to leverage uh, sort of the shared services and efficiencies uh, that you would be expected to leverage in, in this type of uh, integration strategy. Uh, the other piece is the, the nature of travel itself is changing due to demographics and uh, young millennials uh, prefer to uh, shop and sort of gather their information online rather than walking into a brick and mortar operation. And along with the demographics is our traditional core of travelers who have great experiences with us, um, lifetime memories with us. They might be entering into a, um, a later uh, stage of their life where they're not uh, so interested in um, traveling far afield anymore. So we're, we're looking to find new opportunities to interact with our population um, and the realities of uh, the, the population in the North American market where we, we have aging uh, boomers who are getting ready to retire um, and may not want to travel as often as they uh, used to, whether it be for business or for leisure. And the third uh, piece, that is uh, prevalent in the world of nowadays is there's a lot of digital disruption going on in many industries, not just travel, uh, whether it be retail, the traditional telcos, uh, payment systems to the financial institutions, um, content consumption, the Netflix is a, a prime example of that. So all of these sort of forces are um, headwinds for this particular strategy. What we decided to do um, is to use a McKinsey framework called Three Horizons to look at how we can create what's called a multi-sided market. We have 
uh, tremendous strength over the past 30 years in um, not just loyalty from consumers who are directly um, purchasing these leisure uh, type uh, trips, uh, fun trips, um, but also our corporate clients who've been very well served by our uh, corporate uh, travel services division. And so how, how do we leverage that to see the customer um, as one person instead of an interaction uh, defined by their uh, interaction type with us? So if a, a partner from Deloitte books a trip uh, for business and then they go um, and they're interested in a safari in Africa, well, that, that person should be treated as a, uh, as a whole rather than as the type of transaction that they're working with our company. And so what we need to do is we need to steward our existing uh, business. We need to make sure that the, the fundamentals remain strong. But at the same time, we need to recognize this valuable information that we have um, and leverage it so that we can get more synergies uh, within our business. And then eventually, we'd like to move to a stage where we can um, have a formalized in innovation structure in place so that we can search for those next long-term growth opportunities. Um, they might uh, involve brick and mortar, they might involve horizontal in uh, integration, but they they would be part and parcel of a, of a much larger innovation strategy uh, that um, is able to move to search for those long-term um, growth and revenue streams. And so what we need to do to achieve a critical mass of suppliers is we also need to attract a critical mass of users. Um, and multi-sided markets allow us to be able to leverage the loyalty and data that we have uh, built up over the past 30 years in this industry um, in order to better deliver consistently um, a, a travel experience to our end users um, and a customer experience for our vendors who are ultimately looking to uh, maintain their brands uh, with, with our travelers. And so Google is an example of that. Uh, this is from a professor in uh, Milan. Um, and the traditional advertisers on a network platform, um, they it's sort of a blast method. You're not really, you're, competing for attention, not really competing for intention, which is the, the, the sort of special ingredient that is uh, different for, for advertising in Google. And so we're sort of taking those lessons, but applying it to the travel industry as well. We don't want to compete for attention. We want to compete for intention. And so how we're going to do that is we're going to exploit network effects, um, and they can be direct, and that's the direct selling to consumers. It can be indirect in that it might be um, allowing our vendors to get reporting on specific um, pieces that we can monetize um, for as part of our data footprint. Um, in our customer base, and then cross-network effects uh, to sort of interact between uh, the two zones. And so eventually what we see is that uh, Merit Travel Group, um, instead of being three separate uh, lines of businesses, will really treat the customer as um, one uh, individual who will follow us uh, regardless of transaction type, whether it be corporate, or leisure travel um, in their journeys, in their travel journeys, wherever that may take them. And so that would fit uh, neatly into uh, HIS's uh, Japanese um, businesses, which are primarily travel, but there's also stuff like electric, electrical power generation and robotics um, at theme parks, which is actually uh, one of their most uh, profitable um, divisions. So what did this look like for us? Um, so as I mentioned, our, our data footprint was uh, very balkanized um, initially. There were multiple uh, paths and methods uh, where a end user could access the data. Um, and because there were so many multiple paths, although they all fed into one transactional system, 
the multiple paths naturally had their own business rules that were built up over uh, years and years. And so the reports that a, a person, uh, whether they be one of our business users or a customer would get, would quite often, because all these business rules were uh, built in separate paths, um, start to question the validity or accuracy of the data, just because those rules were not well um, codified and maintained within a single repository. So we chose to streamline things um, through a new enterprise uh, reporting stack that took uh, the Travcom, which is our transactional database, as a single uh, source of accounting and financial data, and put it into a single reporting um, data warehouse. And from there, we leveraged Tableau for the visualization and reporting for our end customers, but also for our business users. That way, it's a simple one path uh, method for getting uh, the information that our, our customers and uh, clients need. And then on the financial reporting and analytics side of things, we also have uh, SaaS uh, integrated for um, some of those processes. And now that we've had this uh, streamlining um, accomplished, we're looking at integrating other data sources and again, consuming it afterwards through either Tableau for the end users, for the customers and clients um, and business users, and then SaaS for our financial users. And we're looking at doing this through a, a method that incorporates modern iterative techniques in which we're constantly and continuously improving um, in an agile model. So I'm going to talk about Tableau specifically now. Tableau is the tool that we've chosen to uh, present our information to the business uh, users and to our clients. Um, so what we wanted to accomplish when we decided to undertake this project is we wanted to focus on the client and we wanted to be able to provide those um, BI and advanced analytics services in a way that was very client-centric, always business-focused, and of course, it had to be um, continuously improving, it had to be secure, and it had to be scalable. And so our stack is primarily uh, SQL Server integration services and SaaS um, in the back end, Tableau in the front end, um, and hosted on Azure. And this will allow us eventually to move into some uh, big data um, and contextual analytics uh, type of uh, processes, which we will then, of course, present uh, to our end users through Tableau. So I'm going to go in, and um, this is a uh, screenshot of some of the reporting um, that we're able to offer our clients, um, and this would be a, sort of a, a stock general reports that we would provide to, in this case, it's for the corporate um, travel services client, um, and it, it presents their key metrics in a way that's accessible, um, and bro but broken down at the same time. So we have the three main types of travel, uh, usually in the industry are air, hotel, and car, and then we have an executive dashboard as well that sort of gives a 50,000 foot uh, view of um, what is going on in the in the account uh, for that for that company? Um, the very strong uh, piece or suit is that the uh, Tableau environment allows obviously interaction, and we're we're always mindful when we're building these reports that the interaction is what makes it different and compelling compared to uh, traditional reporting, um, as well as it's very accessible because. Um, the client, if we allow them to, is also able to edit and manipulate um, the data as well to a limited degree. And so this is an example of the executive dashboard uh, with the 50,000 foot view uh, that I mentioned earlier. And what we're looking for in the future is to take advantage of, uh, Tableau has a ton of um, 
features, uh, and I'll go into how we evaluated that as well. Um, but one of the ones that is most compelling to us as a business is the uh, native integration with a lot of the GIS uh, data that is coming out, and uh, Tableau is really um, pushing that um, very significantly as well. So I'm going to go through some of the key criteria and milestones that we had for the project. The first, obviously, in choosing a platform is looking at the alternatives. And we felt that the existing um, incumbents uh, were too, at the end user level, they were too, um, too intimidating and it took too long to make changes or to get the actual uh, business users hands on um, and working with the data because at the end of the day, uh, whether it's the IT department or our data practice, uh, the best and most knowledgeable uh, users of information in the end are the business users. Um, we talked a little bit about, for each platform that we evaluated, what the ease of adoption would be. And for Tableau specifically, it was very compelling in that there were, there was for the Tableau server uh, solution that we uh, chose in the end, uh, we were allowed to have multiple site configurations so that we could provide uh, specific companies or business units or divisions or departments their own website that they could manage themselves um, and that had a sandboxed uh, view of their subset of data. It allowed uh, web editing through the portal, uh, through the Tableau both sites as well. Um, and one of the features that was a uh, key selling feature for our team was the accessibility of the public cloud. Um, so the public cloud is Tableau's um, open source uh, sort of sharing portal for um, dashboards that other users in the Tableau community have, um, have created. And it's sort of a, a, a treasure trove of amazing visualizations uh, that other users have worked on. And you can download uh, many of those workbooks and sort of integrate ideas uh, into your own uh, from that site. So that, that was very compelling. Uh, the implementation process, uh, the server installation, um, having done SAS and a couple of others, uh, SAP, uh, was much more painless than the others. Um, other sort of enterprise applications, uh, I'll say, uh, that we've done before. And the users um, really loved their training um, and their trainer, uh, Kathleen. So shout out to Kathleen from Newcom for that. Um, oh, and uh, yeah, so non-technical users uh, really enjoyed the training from the feedback uh, that they uh, mentioned to me. So we also looked at some um, we didn't want to go with a legacy incumbents like MicroStrategies, uh, but we did look at a, a sort of other um, current competitors and uh, Click, Looker, and Power BI were the other ones that we looked at. For Click in particular, um, the connectors for ex additional data sources, which is a key um, plank in our strategy, were, was an additional cost for each connector. And then, so that, that really uh, sort of uh, weighed the matrix heavily, um, the decision matrix heavily for Tableau. And so some key learnings um, from this whole process and our strategic um, viewpoint is that a data-driven approach is key in driving our digital transformation and catching up and starting to outcompete um, some of the other players in the industry. So I just wanted to pull up um, some external macro trends here. What you're seeing is the market cap of other companies in uh, the market as an economy as a whole right now. And you'll see that um, the vast majority of these companies, they're, they're either multi-sided markets where they're connecting consumers and vendors, or they're uh, playing in a sort of data play where they're monetizing the data that they are collecting from their users or a mix of both. Uh, whether or not they're outrightly saying it or not, the top, the top 10 
of these market caps in the in the economy, the world economy, um, is pretty much dominated by companies that are making sure that they're leveraging their data, making sure that their platforms are working not only for users, but their network of companies that their suppliers, vendors, uh, that sort of interaction. And many of them are also doing uh, intellectual property plays um, in the AI space. So it's very clear that in the age where companies are networked, uh, data and how you leverage it is a key competitive advantage. And for us, Tableau um, made that um, catch up and, the, and we're hopeful that it will make the leap um, for us into that digital economy much easier um, because it is a best in breed visual analytics tool and it allows us to not only um, explore our data but communicate um, and communicate it directly by the end users in a very compelling way. So I'll stop there. I know I ran through uh, quite a lot of strategy um, in a very quick succession. So uh, we'll pause for some questions and then I'll hand it over to Chris, who's going to go into um, a very cool new tool. Uh, I'm really pleased that uh, Tableau has released this, so he'll, he'll go into that um, as well. Perfect. Thanks so much, Dewey. And of course, as soon as you started, I realized, oh, I didn't tell people how to answer, how to ask questions. So for those of you who haven't used GoToWebinar in the uh, GoToWebinar portal on the top right hand, it's probably in the top right hand corner of your screen. There's a chat or a questions uh, section. So please feel free to enter enter your questions there, and we'll make sure that they get asked to the appropriate presenter, or maybe it's both presenters um, at, at the right time. Uh, you can ask them anytime during the presentation. If possible, I'll try and interject and, and ask them at, at a time when it's appropriate, or we can save them to the end, depending on how, how the flow is going. Um, I don't have any in, in that section right now, Dewey, but I do have one that, just as you were talking, kind of came to mind, and, and a, a number of the people on the, the webinar know me and know I've been around a long time. I've, I'm kind of old. Huh? Um, and, and I've seen a lot of projects, and one of the things I know people struggle with is the user adoption. And You know, you can, the old saying, you can bring a little horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Did you have any challenges with that in your project? And I, because your, your use case is different. You're presenting some of the data to your customers, too, as well as internally. So I, I'm just curious as to whether or not that was a challenge. Yeah, I mean, there's there's always going to be um, in any sort of transformation uh, a challenge in getting people to come on board with uh, new systems. But we found that um, once Tableau is released to one business unit uh, and a couple of users, it is really quite quickly uh, word of mouth gets out that there's a simpler, easy, easier, um, and more accessible way to access uh, their reporting, and it's just been um, I've been quite pleased with the adoption that we've gotten um, from Tableau itself. So as of right now, all three of our business units um, are using Tableau as well as our corporate uh, shared services division. Cool, excellent. And they were using Excel before and, and just they were, report yeah. to the ERP, right? Yeah, so as I alluded to, it was a whole mishmash of Excel and Crystal Reports yeah. and, and different business rules, so one number would mean different things to different business units or different business units would have different numbers to uh, wrestle over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Excel is my best friend and my worst enemy all at the same time, I can totally identify. Excellent, um, I don't have any other questions at this time but I'm sure they will come in, so. Um, oh, I do have one here. Uh, one question is how long did, approximately how long did the implementation take? The implementation um, of Tableau itself only took, I would say three months because the bulk of the project was actually getting the data into a, a data warehouse for consumption um, by Tableau just because we wanted to separate our transactional uh, database from the reporting database. Um, the Tableau implementation was, was not significantly long. Right, would you me measure that more in weeks as opposed to months? You said about three yeah, months for the, for the month it was just because we had a process where we were validating um, our own existing those very divergent uh, reports against yep. what's uh, being presented in Tableau. Yeah, excellent. So doing that data validation as well. Yeah, yeah. So the excellent. actual 
uh, server installation <laughs> was like, I don't know, 40 minutes. <laughs> now you're setting the bar kind of high there. I, maybe I <laughs> not to say that. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, excellent. Okay, we'll switch over to Chris and but keep the questions coming and we'll we'll bring them up as 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 we can. Great. Thanks, Erica. Yeah. Um, so hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Again, my name is Chris Foster. I'm the uh, practice lead for analytics here at Newcomp. Um, covers all the things Erica mentioned at the beginning. Um, one of the, those lines of business is Tableau. And like Dewey said, this is a pretty exciting um, and very recent development and release from Tableau. You may know uh, Tableau Prep under its top secret um, development project name as Project Maestro. This is now a, a full-blown, fully public released platform. And so, you know, we as a partner are um, very curious as to where its strengths lie and where it falls in the kind of modern analytics architecture. If you think back to Dewey's slide where, you know, they show um, a repository and SSIS moving data and then into a data mart, I think Tableau Prep isn't a replacement for that process. It, it augments that process where, you know, maybe there's data that doesn't necessarily belong in the data warehouse or in a data mart that we now, we can give the ability um, to our users. They have a tool where they can go get third party data, sew it into more of a corporate data set um, and build visualizations with it. And so I'll jump in, I'll give you a little bit of an overview just for where we think the strengths are with um, Tableau Prep. I will also jump into the tool and do a little click through for you so you can actually see what it looks like. Uh, in fact, there was very recently a release, I think it was on the 12th of June. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about, that was a last minute addition to my presentation. I'll talk a little bit about the enhancements that are being made so you can see a lot of enhancements, um, and I know th those enhancements come from the community. So, you know, when we were talking about, Erica, you asked the question about adoption. That's one of the strengths of Tableau is just that, you know, two, two things, obviously very simple to use. And I think second to that um, is the strength of the community. So there's such a great community of people who are willing to share their work, um, share their techniques, and uh, and so um, I, in even the suggestions. So I know Tableau product development is watching the communities for um, for product enhancements, and that's where a lot of the, the latest ones come from. So let's talk a little bit about Tableau Prep. Um, I think the the whole benefit of this is that it gives you um, two things. When we say a complete picture of your data, that's really when you see. I'll open up the screen. You can see in the little um, picture on the Mac there. There's three coordinated views, and these are kind of zones where you do your work that gives you a real complete picture of the data and flow. So you have the ability to pick which of those views that you're interacting with um, based on the task at hand. And I'll walk you through what each of those panes are. The, the, what I think is really cool is that you get immediate results. And so if you're dragging and dropping a column, um, maybe you want to deselect a column not included in a data set, you create a calculation, um, if you want to edit a value, you select it, directly edit it. Every time you're doing something like that, you can instantly see the results, even on, um, you know, really, really big data sets, right, where we've got millions of rows of data. And so, um, and that's because it's taking advantage of sampling, right, to, to help with performance. And so I think that direct, immediate kind of result experience helps um, users see the results of their actions. Um, and so they know the, the whole goal to fail quickly and, and iterate and refine as you go, right? So reorder steps, experiment, um, very little consequence, um, and then all the way until you're done and ready to publish. So again, I think this is making um, tasks that used to be complex very simple. Inside of Tableau Prep, you'll see that it's got this, it's its own visual experience, and you'll see kind of node by node how that works. Um, the whole point is to make common yet complex tasks like joins and unions and pivots um, and summarization and aggregations, it's to make those simple, right? It's a drag and drop experience in prep, um, no scripting required. I think it's pretty intuitive and you'll see that um, the whole goal and I think it achieves it is to get the results faster and then we're pretty confident that we've done the right thing. Um, there's smart features built in like, um, 
you know, if you've ever ever done any um, preparation of data, especially if you um, live in Excel hell, you know that there's a lot of very repetitive tasks when it comes to um, cleaning data. And so Tableau Prep uses a lot of, it's got a lot of baked in um, smarts and algorithms to fix data prep challenges that are pretty common. So as an example, um, you'll see when we do a little bit of grouping, it uses some fuzzy clustering to turn um, a repetitive task like grouping by uh, pattern or by pronunciation into a one-click operation, which is really, really cool. Um, now, all this is great uh, if it performs well. And so that I know that was part of the development team at Tableau's focus was to in an intelligent way, push those operations down to the database wherever possible, you know, in database type um, type functions so that you can take advantage of the investments you've made in that database tier, right? Using kind of the best of both worlds to get fast execution performance on your workflow. And with that, I mean, it really, the whole point um, of the interface is to keep people in the flow. And so it's really easy to open um, your results from um, Tableau Prep in Tableau Desktop or publish it to server and online. And so if it's easy to share, what we're trying to do is reduce that friction of, you know, going to production or publishing something for testing or into a sandbox so that um, that gap between data preparation and analytics um, is lessened and lessened um, so that we can get to results quicker, right? Um, Though I, I know that um, new tools can be complicated to use, and so you know, in the spirit of Tableau um, making it easy um, to explore data, the the I, the you'll see that a major facet is the, the you'll, and I'll walk you through the environment, all the videos, all the tutorials that are baked in. The goal is to get people up to speed quickly, and so it uses. Um, the Tableau data connectors that you're used to, the calculation language that you're used to, the same governance structure so that you're up to speed quickly. You can collaborate with um, any of your peers at any point in that analytical process. So what I'll do now is I'll flip over to Tableau Prep. Um, I will walk through a little bit of a, uh, of a um, steps in just creating uh, a flow. You'll see that I'm gonna take a couple of files, do some work to them, and then we'll talk about publishing it um, off to a server environment. So this is the Tableau prep uh, environment. Um, maybe what I'll do is just quickly walk you through. It's pretty straightforward. You can see we've got our recent flows. We've got some sample flows that are included as part of the sample data set. On the right-hand side, um, a little embedded video like I was just talking about, making it easy to get started. Links off to um, a more uh, tutorial a visual dictionary because we've got a lot of new icons and a lot of new functionality here just giving people a reference point um, if you're wondering what does that little icon mean um, and a couple more videos what does the interface look like what is the cleaning step you'll see we're going to use that a few times today um, so that's a very important one you can tell they've put a, a, a priority on getting that onto the main page here some links off to resources the blog Register for the Tableau conference. If you've never been to New Orleans, um, this fall is a very good excuse to get out there and register for Tableau conference. The forums, like I said, awesome community. Um, and so they're trying to, we're, we're trying to put everything at the user's fingertips, right? Same sort of experience too. If I want to connect to data, um, it's going to be exactly like I do it in Tableau desktop. So I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, it, because there's a little bit of story behind what we're going to do just to put it in context. The scenario is that I work at a business that does inspections and repairs on cranes. Um, and so I need to forecast my revenue for the rest of 2018. And so I've been sent the forecasting data, which is great, but I want to compare that data against the age of the cranes. And so, and that's because I have a hunch that um, when it comes to forecast relevance, the older cranes will need more maintenance than has been forecasted. And so let's get started. First, let's connect to the data. Um, we'll go to the connection pane. Again, you'll see that it's very similar to Tableau Desktop, and we'll navigate to our 2018 forecasting data. So um, same sort of connections that you're used to. Uh, Redshift, if you want to massively parallel data warehouse, or Denodo, if you're using data virtualization. 
Um, everything is here just like it is in Tableau Desktop. So in this case, I'll connect to Excel. Wow, that's huge. I will uh, click my crane job forecast and open it up. And now you can see, so when I connect to that file, it's showing me the, sh the sheets that are inside of that um, workbook. So we've got four sheets, three of which look like they're dedicated to specific types of mines, and one that is my notes page. And so let's just drag one of these into our, uh, uh, into our workspace. And so now you can see that we're looking at cost forecasting data for our aluminum plant cranes. And in this view, we can change the settings for what we want Tableau Prep to ingest. So if I wanted to only um, bring in the first three months, for example, I could uncheck the rest of the months and they wouldn't be included in my data set. It looks like this first column um, had, a, had a weird header on it. And you can see that these are my cost categories on the right hand side. So I'm just going to rename this to cost category. And that's the way that it's going to look um, in my final data set. You'll see it obviously uh, keeps track of the original field name. The thing is, I don't just want to bring in the aluminum plant um, crane forecast. I want to bring in all, the, all of my forecasts. I could do that one by one, um, but prep allows me to say I want to union those sheets together. So I'm going to use this wildcard union function. Um, I can tell it where to search. So it could, it could parse through an entire folder and search for other files matching a certain pattern. That's what you're seeing right here. Or I could search through specific sheets. So that's what I'm going to do. You can see at the bottom here, here's the, here's the sheets that were included. I'm going to include everything that um, has crane in it. And so using wildcard, I'm going to say everything that uses crane and hit enter. And you can see that uh, my notes page has disappeared. Pretty cool, quick and easy. Remember back to the goals uh, of prep. The goal was to make this as simple as possible, right? So now that's applied. Um, now let's take a closer look at our data. So I'm going to add a step here and then I'll explain exactly what we're looking at. So these are the three panes that I was talking about earlier. So at the top, we've got this flow pane that shows our workflow that we've been developing. Um, in the middle, we have our data summaries or profiles and what we call the profile pane. And the profiles let you see um, really quickly the shape of the data, right? To see any outliers, any nulls, kind of a quick pulse on data quality and completeness. And then at the bottom, um, we've got our row level data and what we call the data grid. And so I'm going to use that terminology uh, in the next couple of minutes. Remember, flow pane, profile pane, data grid. Okay. Um, so you can look, these cost categories are a little wacky. We've got um, some duplication happening here. We've got billable cost, billable cost USD is because, you know, we've got three different um, mills or crane operators sending in different forecasts. That happens, we get quick data, we get data quality issues like that. What I can do though, is I can use some of the smarts that are built in. So I can click on the, on the column that I want to group, for example. I can say group and replace, and in this case, I'm going to group by pronunciation. And just like that, it's actually grouped them into three main categories. You can see that little paper clip says that we've included three rows in those two and two rows in this one, and that's because parts cost and parts cost, um, pronunciation-wise, don't sound like the same thing. One sounds like a multiple, but in our case, it is. So all I can do, I can click on parts cost, include the part cost in that grouping, and then I'm done. And now we've got our grouping done in that first clean step. So, so far um, we're getting there. I think our data now is structured um, not in the most ideal way though for analytics, right? We've got a wide short table with a column for every month remaining in 2018. As an analyst, you and I both know that's not the best way to work with data, um, especially when we're building visualizations. So what I'm going to do is pivot the data um, so that we get that all in one, in one column. So to add my next step, I'm going to add a pivot. It's a very specific step in here. When I add that pivot, you see this little pane slides in on, on the left-hand side. And all I do is I select the columns that I want to 
pivot. So I'm going to pivot every, all of my months columns, basically. Deselect my cost category and my file paths. And you can see there's a little hint that says drop fields here. Hopefully you can see that on the, on the uh, go to meeting. I'll drag it over. And you can see it did something pretty smart. Uh, it recognized that the term cost was being used in all of the column headers that I have. And so what it did is it automatically renamed my new pivoted column cost and uh, has stripped that out of the pivoted names from each of the months, right? So it's got some smarts built in. Now pivot one names isn't what I want, so we can double click on this and uh, let's call this months. And we're good to go. Um, the table names column right here has our uh, has our crane names. What I want to do now is create a calculated field for that that gives me uh, a crane name column. So I'm going to add a new step just to keep this clean. I'm going to go to my table names column, and I'm going to create a calculated field based off of that table names column. In this case, I'm going to call it crane. And you'll definitely recognize this same um, calc window experience as in desktop. In this case, I am going to replace, and you can see it's already giving me hints on what to do. What am I going to replace? I'm going to replace my table names column. Um, and in that, I'm going to replace the underscores with a blank. Validating it for me looks good. I will save that and now I've got a brand new column called crane based off of this table names column. I don't need this anymore. Even though it's being used for that calculation, uh, I can hide it and remove it to clean up my data set. So now the forecasting uh, data looks good, but if you think back to why I'm here, I want to compare it against the age of these cranes to see that any of the older cranes need more maintenance than we've forecasted. So I'm going to bring in my second file in this case, it's a text file, and this is my age of cranes file. And what I can do with this, um, so I could do all the same data prep that I did on, the, on my other data set. In this case, what I want to do, and you watch as I drag it, there's two drop zones that I can drop it on. When I drop it onto this last step, I can um, union it with this, this step, or I can join it. And so that's exactly what I want to do. I want to join it based on the crane name. So this join interface, um, very, very helpful. You can see there's a ton of information here. Um, you know, when in, in a lot of other tools, I've worked with BI tools for, um, you know, well over a decade now, it's not always easy to see what those join results are going to be, say, unless you run a report or you run some sort of job or process. So, you know, this sort of interface is very helpful for me as somebody, you know, say an analyst or a citizen data scientist sitting out in the business. This is very important to me to see the results of this join relationship that I'm creating, um, what's being lost, what's duplicated, um, and so forth. And so that's what you're looking at right here. You see the red cranes here in this column are showing me which ones are not going to be included. So these are being dropped because of my inner join, right? Um, you can see the clause that's being used, so crane equals crane from left to right, and it's color-coded um, all the way across. So I know my blue is coming from the left side, the orange is coming from the right-hand side. Here I'm seeing the join results, and I can actually click on those and see what the results are going to be row by row, right? So um, that's really helpful for me to see if any rows are being dropped, making sure I get the right data set at the end. Um, any of these steps? can be cleaned, so, you know, or can be renamed. So let's say I want to share this workflow with somebody else. I might want to rename some of these steps, like this is where I created the months, right, and pivoted to the month. So I won't go through and rename everything, but you have control over the name of each of your steps in your flow as well. Um, that's really all I want to show. I think it, this is our resulting data. One last change maybe that I'll make just to change my month field, so you see this is actually, um, this ABC is showing me that it's a string. I can actually just click on it and tell um, Tableau Prep that it's a date and to treat it as such. Um, no reloading, no extra step added here. It's just being done at that join step. Um, and so it's uh, now when I use it in a tool, 
um, like Tableau Desktop or, or online, you'll be able to uh, treat it as a date, right? Easy for me now that I've done this work to go publish this. So I could just, all I do is add an output to my uh, to my workflow. I have a number of um, options to do that. So I can save it um, as a file. And in that case, I can save it as the new Tableau data extract, right? The hyper file, um, the old TDEs, or I can push it out as a CSV. I can also easily publish this to Tableau Online. So I could connect to our, you know, new comp Tableau Online instance and select the project that I want to publish it to, give it a name, and away it goes, right? So very quickly, we've gone from having uh, our own flat files, we've done some manipulation, and now I can publish those off and everybody can use them, okay? So that, that's the bulk of what I wanted to go over. Um, what I'll do is I'm just gonna jump back to um, the presentation now just because I want to show you, I wanna uh, relay a couple of really important things to you. Um, you might be thinking, okay, so what does it cost me? Well, Tableau Prep, um, for those of you that have Tableau desktop licenses right now, it's available at no charge, and that's until uh, June 30th, 2020. So everybody that's on current maintenance, um, they took a check as of April 24th to see who is uh, on maintenance. If you qualify, you can use it for the next two years. Um, at that point, if you want to continue using it, um, I don't know if uh, hopefully most of you are familiar with kind of the licensing um, adjustments that are happening in the Tableau world. After June 30th, 2020, you need that Tableau creator subscription to continue using prep. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about new features that were just released. If you want to operationalize uh, Tableau prep, say run a flow from um, a scheduling tool external to Tableau, now you have command line activation. Um, I pivoted months in one step, now you can pivot multiple groups of fields in one pivot step, so that's really cool. Lots of new connectivity options. The UI keeps getting enhanced, so now you've got this lasso selection to select a bunch of nodes, um, a faster drag and drop, faster refresh from your editing values. You probably saw it took a couple of seconds there. I'm on the older version. Um, you saw it took a couple of seconds to refresh. Um, much better feedback, you'll see it's got even more data profiling when loading tables, lots, lots more. Um, more functionality being released at all times. If you want more details on this stuff, we do um, these kind of web events and in-person events uh, often. We've got uh, an upcoming event um, here in Calgary, so I'm based in Calgary on July 4th, where we're going to talk um, just about modern analytics kind of from start to finish. It used to be pretty simple with source data, some sort of repository and a BI tool on top. Things are much more complicated now. Um, where does Hadoop fit? Spark, I've got unstructured data, I subscribe to third-party data. I need social data, data, so I work with you know a number of different APIs. How does that all fit together? Tableau is gonna be a big part of that story, so if you're in Calgary, please come out on July 4th. Um, you know, uh, adoption is pretty straightforward with Tableau. Um, if you wanna go a little bit deeper, um, these are very, very popular um, training programs that we host as an official Tableau training partner, um, right from fundamentals to advanced. If you're an administrator, um, obviously that's where it gets a little bit more complex. You want to hear best practices and stuff. Um, and the Tableau courses are awesome. We offer all these in class online or on site. Um, because modern analytics is, is moving at such a rapid pace, there's a lot to learn, a lot to ingest. Um, you're probably getting asked by colleagues, peers, superiors, what should we be doing? What do all these things mean? What's a MongoDB? And so um, the team, um, you know, our open source and data science team um, put together these analytics boot camps, which are awesome. Uh, um, you can check out our website if you want to read more about them. What they are is just um, a half day session where you pay $1 amount and you can invite as many friends from your organization as you want. We'll walk you through some of the, the hottest topics amongst our client base right now, data lakes and Hadoop, um, data science, we've got one specifically for machine learning, predictive analytics, data blending and preparation, things like Tableau Prep. Um, one that is the most popular is our API bootcamp because so many people are, you know, want to geocode something with Google Maps, they want to use uh, weather data, they want to pull in social media information. The world now talks to each other um, at the data tier through APIs. And so strongly suggest you check some of these out. I'll be a part of some of them. Um, the rest of the data science team will be part of the other one. So a good chance for you to meet some experts, have somebody on speed dial 
um, and a good way to kind of get up to speed. So with that, I will wrap. Um, Erica, I guess I'll pass it to you and see if any questions rolled in. Happy to answer them. Sure, we've got um, some requests for more information. Of course, that's no problem at all. We love sending more information. Um, <laughs> I have another question that's that's come in, and that is, what for Dewey? I believe, what do you think was the biggest challenge in your project? Sorry, you might uh, get mute, Dewey. Yeah, <laughs> the biggest challenge <laughs> uh, in terms of our project uh, was actually um, gathering gathering together the stakeholders and getting the requirements um, Ooh, sort of codified one, yeah. uh, into something that made sense. But also, I think, if, especially if your organization like ours um, was running a little bit behind um, in keeping up, um, you'll find that once you start iterating and start releasing things, there'll be a flood of requests and uh, making sure that all of the business units sort of sit together in one room and are interacting um, and sort of prioritizing their hit list of the next pieces that they want addressed. That's that's the key in making sure that everyone's satisfied and not feeling that they're left out. Yeah, getting consensus amongst the stakeholders is definitely tough. Yeah, yeah. hurting cats, I believe. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, Dewey and Chris, for your sharing your valuable time. We uh, finished pretty much right on time with three minutes to spare here. So I'm going to give everyone three minutes back in their day so that they can go back and check their email, refresh their coffee or tea, and uh, uh, sign off with that. We will be uh, following up with any other questions that do come in, so please feel free to keep sending them. Uh, also feel free to reach out to ourselves or your Tableau reps, and uh, they will be happy to, to send you further information as required. Again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and uh, we will wish you a good day. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.